it can look like a variety of different things here and there. Um, and that's good, but we need to be able to sort of address it for the businesses that are out there um, and how they can actually use it and what's really kind of stopping it. So I've got a couple points here that I'm going to present and then hopefully we can um, actually I've got to do the zoom thing first. Um, but some of the, the, the scenarios this morning that, well, this morning for me that we were watching the magician, um, the, the mixologist, that sort of thing was really kind of cool to see because that's really fundamentally where we're heading is, is towards more of that experience of events, that experience of being online behind this, this zoom thing. And, and yes, there is zoom fatigue and that sort of thing, but how can we actually really define that? How can we make it a lot easier to, to, be able to again create that remarkable digital experience worth remembering so can everybody see my screen i'm just going to go into present mode yep yep does that look okay yep yeah cool okay so do you guys all have like your your midnight coffee then or what yes no you're not going to fall asleep on me and and if anybody switches off their video i know that you've fallen asleep so that's that's the signal there so oh and uh, actually we've got amy welcome amy so glad you can make it <laughs> sorry i had to unmute myself oh, hi doyle okay. thanks for inviting me yeah 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 amy perfect i'm so glad you can make it um amy is a, a customer experience expert uh, based out of brisbane and uh, i brought her invited her rather to to come and actually take you know some some different sides and see how we can actually create um uh you know some some information that helps us be able to to go forward with this so really looking forward to your your uh, feedback and insights amy i don't want to put you on the spot <laughs> she's just traveled from overseas um and i'm, I'm jet forward. lagging pretty hard right now doyle <laughs> yeah 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 jet lag and and um uh, into quarantine as well so welcome and thank you so much for joining um, all right, cool. So this is what I'm going to be talking about modes, models, and moments of adaptable businesses and how we can actually look at moving things forward. Um, and I've added at midnight for those in, in the Eastern U S state as well. So we want to be able to engage the experience for business, right? Um, I say this in a lot of my presentations, it's April, 2021. Where are you from here? Where to from here rather, where are you going and what are you doing? Uh, as well. So uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Doyle Bueller and I guide digital, digital challenger businesses in navigating the daunting digital economy and overcoming the fear, anxiety, and resistance of operating as a true digital company in the 2020s. I create digital pathfinders, entrepreneurs, and SMEs who want to make a bigger impact, get better results, and find better customers online so the world knows who they are and how they do business. So the big questions, will you adapt or die without digital? And I want to throw it out there as a big question. Can we answer that? What, what do you guys think? Can, will you adapt or will business, more businesses die? I'm going to get into some of the, some, a few case studies, but generally speaking, what, what, what's your interpretation here um, in terms of what do we need to do differently? Is, is this all there is? Um, are we forever, you know, pushed into sort of that, that zoom window, that zoom webcam? What do you guys think? Anyone? I'll start. Keith. Hey, Keith, welcome. Well, Jonathan, you put up your hand. You go first. No, you spoke first. That, that, that totally trumps the hand up. Uh, okay. Look, I, I think based on what we've been doing, mate, I, I, I've noticed that there's, there's three possible ways forward, none of which involves going back. You know, no one wants to go back to 2018. So I, I think the way forward to adapt is... Um, real life stuff with a little bit of extra like this, like a Zoom call or like you had a magician on today, you said, a bit of fun and funkiness. Another, another way forward is that we have to adjust, adjust to the online world or we have to make it fun with swag and uh, goodies and presents and we have to make the online world feel like the offline world. And the third way forward is to accept that we all want to hug each other and go into the city, but we have to probably have some online components. Like the, many people here might not have heard of the Byron Bay Blues Festival, but that was a company that in 2020 cancelled a festival 
ran it again a year later with no differences and were surprised to think that it failed again and they lost a million dollars. So, you know, that's a company that may deserve, probably deserves to die, you know, in many ways. So that's a horrible thing to say, but, you know, they had, it, they had a chance. They had a chance to do something different and they did nothing different. And then they complained when COVID came and bit them on the bum again. And I think that's sort of what you're talking about, aren't you? Is that, is that a good yeah. sort of little uh, uh, story about what's going on here? Yeah, well, that was one of the case studies. But yeah, no, feel free to talk about it too, Keith. And uh, thanks for joining in as well. I appreciate that. Uh, Keith yeah. is my um, best mate from Melbourne, and we've been doing a lot of exploration uh, and studies of sort of the digital experience and how best to create that. So hopefully we'll have some insights into that uh, as we get into it. Um, yeah, so so with the Byron Bay, that was like a music festival, blues mu music festival. And I think it was, you know, moderately small. It was like 60,000 people. Um they had to cancel last year because it was like two weeks ago, I think the beginning of April in 2020. So they canceled it outright. But this year they decided to just continue as per normal. So, um, and two days before the event, there was a snap lockdown and they decided to cancel the event. So they lost out all the people who were actually almost, I think most of the people were already on their way. So on the uh, way, that, yeah, on the way as well, because they didn't have a plan B, right? They didn't think that, well, maybe in a year from now, we'll, we'll actually have that ability to create a hybrid event. event. Um, and, and, you know, for the conversation too, I, I, I posed that question on, on LinkedIn and a couple of articles that I wrote in. And it, it's true. And I'd love to discuss it. Is that one person said, I don't want to watch a blues festival on a screen, which, you know what? You're 100% correct. But guess what? Would you rather not watch it at all or have an option to watch it on a small screen or even a, you know, a big screen? You, let, let's be honest, like you can buy 70 inch TVs for like $500 nowadays. So, you know, how do we can actually- Can I jump in there again and, and give some options? Sure. Um, there's two th things going on with that Blues Festival and ple please feel free to jump in, Jonathan, because you did put your hand up and we haven't forgotten about you. Um, the, the two things about the Blues Festival is that Aussies travelled all around Australia to get there. So maybe Aussies wouldn't want to stand in uh, watch a Blues Festival on, uh, online. But what about the you know, 8 billion other people around the world that are thinking, I'm not coming to Australia and I dig blues and for 25 bucks, I can tune in at 3 in the morning in Johannesburg or, you know, Beijing or, uh, you know, I can just get up Sunday morning and watch who's ever on for $20. And it's got to be better than nothing because you're not coming. So the, the really interesting thing about the Blues Festival is what the consumer thought, but also the, the owner, the, the promoter. The promoter lost everything. There is nothing salvageable from that event. There's no recording. There's no upsell. There's no, they're not selling T-shirts. You know, there's nothing going on. So yeah, they, from the really from the it. business from the business point of view, you know this person was really short sighted. I mean, I, I still can't believe that he did it. From the consumer's point of view, I get that you're driving three days to get there. You want to sleep in a tent and you want to see your heroes playing guitar in the middle of the night, and that's just the coolest thing. And why would you do that online? But the consumer is only half the half the story. Yeah. The owner, and the promoter, lost was going to lose a million dollars. To me, and to me, there's a way of, of being able to enhance that experience so so that, that you are able to, it's not a live performance, but, you know, again, a lot of times your live performances, you're, you know, you're not front row. So you're like way at the back of the, yeah. of the theater or the, or that. Are we Jonathan, on the money here? I'd like to yeah. hear from other people about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, Jonathan, go for it. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the, I don't know if you guys remember, I think we're all old enough here to re maybe remember the ads that Xerox put out about the paperless office back in the nineties. Um, as though, as though the digital were going to replace something. And, um, you know, it, it, Clay Shirky wrote a great blog post 2009. I think it was, um, you talking about the, the, the printing press. And uh, you know, sort of when that technology was introduced, the first books that they produced actually looked like the manuscripts. They were literally designed to look like man. It took them 
50 years to figure out pagination and indexes and tables of contents and the, the, ah, the, whole, yeah. the whole apparatus that makes a book completely, you know, that we think is totally, we take for granted. Um, and so it's like, I, I, I kind of resist, I, I really want to resist this idea. People who see the digital and the kind of in-person as competitors, like, they, they're going to cooperate in ways that are difficult to understand right now. We're still yeah, yeah. thinking it through. And so yeah. what I would put forward is this idea of, you know, sort of, we need to think cooperatively with these technologies. How are they going to cooperate uh, rather than compete with one another? Co competition is a losing, you know, sort of mental model, I think, in thinking about this. Um, absolutely. And, and yeah, that, that's very important because a lot of, you know, even some of the discussions earlier today were, it, it almost sounds like it's a competition and, and that feedback about, you know, Byron Bay, it's, it's not like we can have both uh, one of the, who's that little taco girl, the, um, not Taco Bell, but anyway, she's, you know, she says, why can't we have both tacos? It's like, do you want hard tacos? Do you want soft tacos? <laughs> you can have them both. So, yeah. Um, cool. So any other kind of points that, um, you know, is this, is this black and white? Is this gray? You know, we're, we're the gray swan guild. So is there a lot of gray here? What, what does anybody else think? I think there's a, a level of falseness here where people imply a little bit of progress on the digital front will solve everything. And the, the problem is your customer is traveling about five times faster than most companies. And so you're not trying to keep up pace with the status quo. You're trying to keep up pace with your customer or an expectation that's out there for the future. And um, for the most part, companies fail on that standpoint. There was a really good brain key study that they do every two or three years. And it's compounding interest on the fact that the customer for mm. about a decade has been ahead of uh, the business's ability to react to it. So there's this increasing gap between now, I'm a CEO and I really want to transform myself and be digital, but the tools that allow you to do that and the, uh, the pace at which you're doing it never will catch up with your customer unless you make a bold, courageous attempt to intervene on, on your inevitable trajectory. So um, I think there's, there's a lot of good lip service and a lot of good um, theater that gets practiced here that, that really isn't enough. There's a huge gap, Sean. Like the digital adoption, I think it rose to 30%. 35 percent at you know april 2020 like a year ago um that are able to sort of provide and deliver and do all kinds of those digital things obviously it encompasses a lot more than just a website but on the other side there's yeah like you said from the customer side 70 to 80 percent of people actually want to be able to engage with your business uh in the digital space and and guess what what's that gap 50 percent of businesses can't actually do that properly so they're totally missing out. All right, cool. So I want to talk about, this is kind of the over, overriding theme here. So modes, how are businesses adapting their delivery to the new reality? Why are only some businesses seeing the long-term opportunity? And again, these are, these are questions that I'd love to get into. Uh, models, are, are there some good, bad, ugly models of digital? What's missing? What are some of the, you know, who are miss, who's missing the point? Um, and then moments, are we creating remarkable digital experiences worth remembering? Remembering, or is it the same old, same old? Boring heads. Boring heads. <laughs> yeah. Keith and I talk a lot about this. And, and that's honestly, yes, that's what this can actually be. I'm not a magician. I'm not a clown, although some people might think I'm ugly um, or look like a clown. But <laughs> um, so, you know, we have to think of how we can actually do that. And, and again, it doesn't have to be, we don't all have to be actors we don't have to be comedians we don't all have to be magicians we can kind of create that moment in our own way with our business and the value that we're actually providing on that as well so um so what do people want and this is what again uh keith and i have sort of discovered over the last year what elements of experience are important and we have these right now right what do they want in this sort of pseudo pseudo gray space between digital and real they want a sense of adventure they want connections that count and they want a depth of engagement i'd love to hear your thoughts are are can you do this right now what what do you think what do people think here can we deliver this right now digital i think, I think you can argue that it is being delivered now Sorry, that was Antonia. 
or who was I that? think that people I think that various platforms do deliver this kind yeah. of thing that different platforms deliver a sense of adventure or Facebook you could argue you know or or Instagram can deliver connections that count certainly you can have the depth of engagement whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook or or any of it I think these are important experiences what I think is interesting is whether people what's the what is if you're looking at it from a business perspective what's the value of being able to deliver this and how do you need to deliver it in a way that that results in the most value that to me is the the interesting question about digital digital uh, makes a lot of things possible, but whether those things po that are possible add value to your to your uh, target audiences is the challenge. Jonathan, yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I I agree with Ant Antonia's comments there. Uh, I, I'd like to add one here. This uh, uh, we're we're preaching to the converted here about people who are ready to be sort of open to adventure, you know, sort of uh, depth of connection and engagement. Um, uh, what a, you know the com comfort, you know, which we've kind of disparaged a little bit in the past. Well, Sean's been at it for 17 hours. Um, I, I just have to say that I salute you as a as a marathon zoomer. This has got to be a record of some kind. He's looking kind of sleepy there, though. No, that's not <laughs> sleepiness. That that's that's depth of thought, right? That's profundity. Uh, don't Thank mistake you, the yeah. two. But bemused wonderment, yes. <laughs> bemused wonderment. Uh, First um, use of the word profundity goes to yeah. Jonathan. That's yeah, a bingo. Sense making bingo. Thank oh, you. A bingo. Okay. <laughs> wow. Well, have to pull that out again sometime. Um, but. Um, I, I, I think unquestionably these all are possible. Um, I, I'd like to ask the group, uh, what do you think is required? What level of investment do you think is required to bring these about? Um, I just taught a class and there's no doubt in my mind that we achieved all of these, but that was a heavy investment, so, you know, constant, so Jonathan, you know, you like twice a week, feel, you know. Da, da, da. Yeah, so you feel that there's like a, the barrier here is cost. Is, is that it? I'm asking if that's the barrier. I, I okay. think it's possible, yeah. but you know, can can't you know what's required to actually make it happen? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, is cost a barrier here? Well, co cost is certainly one of the barriers, or at least it's the claim barrier by many of the people. But really what it is, is it's a matter of the, the, the risk of the unknown for people who aren't digital natives who still feel uncomfortable. And it's the cost of people not being able to manage their uncertainty and get through their own uncomfort, uh, you know, to put their trust in other people to make some of these decisions on their behalf. There are two different levels here, Chris. I think there's a, and there's maybe multiple audiences, but I find I don't know if you've uh, been around any old people during this uh, pandemic and they've had to online order or whatever. There is this extraordinary, order? like, oh my Lord, I can do that, Ethel? This mm -hmm. is crazy. Um, and so I think there is being that depth of engagement for it once they cross that Rubicon and go, wow, this is possible. Um, there's another group of people that are probably more like me and you, where it's like, I got to be honest, I've been ruined by technology because my level of being surprised by technology is, you know, you were going to present something on spatial today. And, and then part of me was like, I hope this takes zoom and takes it five steps further, but I am going to be, have a Spocky and eyebrow raised at whether that's going to be able, the last time I was truly, truly impressed by a piece of technology was probably five years ago when I was like probably using Uber for the first time. And I'm like, Oh my God, I can see the cab coming my way. That was probably the last time I was truly elated by a piece of technology. Um, are there two? Can I ask a, can I quick, quick, can I ask a question about that, Sean? Or were you, you go, Chris, were you, you were, wanted to pick back on that? On, no, I was just going to say, like most things, it's something that you have to experience. <laughs> Okay. 
All right. Uh, I'll wow. Maybe to the next. I've slide. never seen that before. Look, <laughs> Sean and are Doyle. Those, are those flowers? No. Those look like flowers. Thumbs up. Oh. Thumbs up. I might have to. Okay. Yeah, it's a thumbs up. <laughs> oh, I good. apologize, Sorry, folks, Chris. but the, the, yeah. we're back to normal programming. Doyle, over back to you. Oh, that happens on midnight radio too, doesn't it? I guess. Um, yeah, sorry, Chris, you were going to just finish up there. I was a bit distracted. I was, I, I was too. I, Sean had asked yeah. me another question. I had an answer, but I don't recall. <laughs> I, I think Jones manual had an answer. That's for sure. I'm sorry. I really don't remember the question. All right. All right. Cool. Uh, no the infrequency yeah. of being impressed and you were going to present. Something oh yeah. So, so what I was going to say is that it, it really is like most things you have to experience it. I mean, if you go back to your first open space or World Cup Fair or any facilitated public event that was, you know, more than just a panel and a podium, right? Um, interacting in different ways and, and having that light facilitation and the amazing experience of understanding and connection that came from it. Um, it's, it's very much like that. And, you know, there was actually been a study recently where they had a, a school, well, not the whole school, but a class in, in a school in Georgia that went on a virtual field trip to China inside virtual reality. And three months later, when they asked them about it and talked about it, half of the kids actually thought they went to China. Because the empathetic effect in there, it is essentially feels real. Uh, this, what you experience in there, and it's just really quite amazing. And, and given that the headsets are down to three hundred bucks now for a Quest Two, uh, it's highly recommended. Is it real though, Chris? I was actually doing. Um, there was a conference from Europe yesterday on the future of the digital experience, and, uh, and there might be two uh, trains of thought here, but it was kind of semi-virtual. Um, and to me, it kind of turned me off, like almost from the get go, because it was, you know, kind of the, the animated type backgrounds, you jump into this big building that looks like a big conference hall. And then there'd be kind of a semi virtual real people kind of thing. And it actually turned me off because when I go to something like this, I actually want to connect with people. I don't want to connect with like a, a virtual looking type scene. So I, I don't know. Is there a difference? Well, I, I was walking through a uh, Facebook venues lobby the other day, uh, which is where they host some live events. And right now they're streaming a major laser concert in 180 or whatever it is over there. And uh, a couple of blokes and, and, and ladies from the UK came up and just started chatting me up. And so, you know, again, that sort of social sort of interaction and, and serendipity. Uh, so we got to talk a little bit about where we were from and, and what we were doing there. And one of the one of the gentlemen actually heard a bunch of kids whining and, you know, causing nuisance or whatever, and decided to go over there and kind of deal with it. I was like, oh, that's really interesting to see. And it was like being there in person. Yeah. And it did still have some of the cartoony, but the spatial and the other stuff. Uses photogram photogrammetry. Ah, I can't say the friggin' word. But they actually take a, a photo that you upload and they create a three dimensional avatar face. And then they animate it when you're speaking. And it's, uh, it's getting there close. And the next generation of Quest is going to actually have uh, 3D, um, well, essentially video cameras that are watching your facial expressions to be able to reflect them in real time into the digital environment. And at that point, you know, it's going to take it even one level further. But, yeah, I, but so I do think you'll be amazed if you check it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I was kind of, I did have like my first VR headset experience like a couple of years ago at a trade show. Um, but again, it kind of, uh, as Sean was saying, it didn't, I didn't go like, oh, wow, I'm totally, you know, thrilled by that. It was like, okay, what next kind of thing? It didn't see to be sort of a monumental type change. So the question is, and that's to everybody too, it's like, is, are we headed as the experience side of things towards more of these virtual type wearing the headset or more kind of like this, but with, you know, a lot more engagement, a lot more opportunity to, to connect with people. Can I jump in there? Yeah, yeah, go for it, Keith. Um, I was very interested to see how, given what we've been talking about, 
because we've done extensive research on that, that site you were talking about was called Me Meet You, Y W Y Double O. And I, I was actually quite disappointed when I heard you didn't like it because I, I thought it had enormous promise. But um, one, one of the things I'm, I'm noticing here on Zoom as a person that does this all the time is that, you know, I'm looking at who's there, but I have no way of contacting them. And I think the next step for us, separate to the VR headset and the AR apps, is a site which we may try soon called Run the World or things like this, where you can, you can be in a panel, <coughs> but I can then go and DM Sean. I'm sure there's a little private message function here, but I'm talking about going to Sean's LinkedIn page or Sean's Twitter account, which I've already done separately by just researching him. But, you know, wouldn't it be great if I had a button that says Sean on LinkedIn, Sean on Twitter, click. And then suddenly when I go away in an hour's time, I can still remember that we had this chat and I can contact you rather than, what was that guy's name again? How, how many hours was he away? <laughs> you know, so is, is that where we're heading? Are we heading towards more tech that suits us as people? Like Zoom is fine, but it's a bit flat. We've run, we've run out of options, haven't we? It's a really interesting point, but as with our ability in the past 20 years to, you know, get a photo live to somebody versus having to go download it off of a card through a reader into a machine to FTP it to a server to then create a URL to paste into a page and that. Uh, software has been progressing at reducing the number of steps in processes. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. and it's getting smarter about understanding contextually what those steps should be. And so with those two elements, we have been chopping away at it as Nuance did with dictation software. Uh, one of the great things that I liked about this software we were looking at for VR is I didn't need to learn how to use a virtual keyboard. It did dictation and it was yeah. accurate every time, right? So we're heading into that world where uh, even those dictation apps like Otter and others are going to be able to turn our speech into actions that then puts it within the right context for us to go back and complete later. I'm involved okay. in a VR art gallery. Uh, I posted it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's amazing. It blew me away. I bet them two years ago, Chris. And uh, if uh, the Oculus, if you haven't tried it, you should try it, I believe, uh, because it's the first experience in, in Sean's Star Trek world where you're actually in the holodeck. So the immersive, so the, the immersive nature of it, and it depends on what kind of uh, thing you're in. That's the difference here. There's no, there's no machines there. You're just in the space. And then one of the innovations that happened with the latest version of Oculus is they, they changed the software. So they have all these scanners. So they see your hands. So you had these devices at the beginning, they have these stupid joysticks, they have buttons on them, you're poking around in this space. Then all of a sudden in a year, right, Chris? They went away, your hands became the controller. And you can see that this machine is teaching you how to move around in this space. So there's this one game that I played really early on, some type game martial arts, and I've done a bit of martial arts. So I was watching my friend with the headset on who is not a martial arts artist doing this stuff, right? Which looks really silly. When someone who doesn't know how to fight fights, they look silly. And I'm looking at him going like, what the hell are you doing? Because he's got this headset on and he's in another space, completely immersed. So I put this thing on and all of a sudden the muscle memory, it gets working the, my muscle memory in a very immersive way. This is new technology. Now you take that a step further where I think we're gonna go, Elon Musk and the brain link you know, Keith, I'm going to be calling you and I will be calling you. When I yeah, see look at this, I will say I will be, we will be in the same space and the immersion between our brains is what I see you see. When I watch those monkeys that you found playing Pong with their brains on the weekly wrap, was that what you do? Was that you do? Or was that uh, Augustine? So if we can connect to computers directly in a brain interface, then human to human. Okay, now we're talking digital. Okay, but let, let's take, let's roll that back a bit, back to 2021. <laughs> oh, oh, the, the, these are, the, uh, certainly immersive on, on uh, immersion is big. Uh, yeah, yeah, true. Very big, the but, glasses will get smaller. Uh, this is predictable. But is that, is, then I'll ask the question, is that what the customer wants? Super. Is, is, you know, is, are they driving that? 
that demand think, or is it us or in, in technology enthusiasts going, hey, wait a sec, that'd be really cool. Why don't we do this? We saw it in retail though, right? So we were at the beginning of the pandemic when people said, oh my goodness, you can't go to the store. No one will buy anything. You don't buy anything online. And all of a sudden the pictures got good enough and the day service got good enough and the brands got good enough. And all of a sudden yeah. they're doing that. Can you imagine if you actually had a store experience on the on your desk where like I'm looking at the computer or the hand cream or whatever and it's it's augmented reality so you'll do that so yeah i think it's getting there and fast and, and let's just look at it against price point though because that's really the key thing to get it to mass market getting it under 300 us dollars was was huge um you, i, I hear rumors about... that they've sold two million units uh, and they can't keep up with demand to keep the stores full right now and people are selling them black market double retail yeah. um so anyways it's uh and now the hololens stuff because the government contracted that is going to make hololens even less yeah. expensive so well do you want to talk about the merge cube well, the merge cube app is yeah, 20 bucks and the headset is 49 bucks well they're selling them for like two dollars at walmart apparently in the u.s um which which allows that that ar i've got one here i i'm not sure i can I can't reach it from here, uh, but, but maybe I'll do that while somebody else is talking. Um, but pretend. Amy, I wanted to ask you, you're, you're kind of the, the retail rock star queen. Do you mind kind of sharing your experiences of, of how the retail environment has, has changed or has it in the last year? I mean, obviously, despite lockdowns and that sort of thing, how has shopping changed? What, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, I mean, retail has definitely changed. There's no, you know, there's no doubt about that. Um, but the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics for people who aren't in Australia, <laughs> um, you know, they just came out with their retail figures today, I think it was. Um, and, you know, the online figures have completely shrinked back to uh, 2019. So uh, they're right back nearly one point above, basically. So, Which so is odd. It, it went up and then it dropped back to to oh yeah it, it was huge levels online. I think um okay I'm just trying to, to to look at the figures while we're on here I think it went up um well at, at one stage it was up 18 points um above you know um and then it's dropped back it went below um in August. It was negative 4% for some reason. And in December, uh, dropped down to point, negative 0. 0.5. And it's just, it's leveling off now. Um, so I think, and I think that's due to a few things fluctuating in the market. One is, um, you know, there were people who, uh, consumers who, like somebody in here just said, Oh my God, I can't believe, you know, you can, you can do that. <laughs> and so that was new and novel. Um, and in Australia anyway, you know, we don't have the lockdowns that some other places are kind of still dealing with, or I suppose the scares maybe. Um, I just okay. got back from the U S and we couldn't, we, we, I didn't dare go into a store. <laughs> <laughs> um, my mom was kind of ill and we ordered online and did curbside pickup because I just didn't want to, um, yeah, I didn't want to, to go into the store. Um, but I think what's happened here anyway, is that we've had this huge surge in the marketplace. The consumer became comfortable, certainly Ethel, whoever, uh, <laughs> said that name, I think it was you, Jonathan, no, um, no, that was yeah. Sean. That was Sean. That was oh, Sean. was it? Okay. So, you know, Ethel's figured out, oh, this is so cool. And, you know, I can do it. But then um, for here anyway, the ABS figures say, yep, she she did that. She tackled it, thought it was cool. And now she's went back to shopping in store. <laughs> so there there is a slight, I mean, there is a slight um, increase from sort of pre-COVID, but it's it's not really that significant to speak of. Um, they picked up a, a huge um, market share in online retailing, and then it kind of has really shrunk, you know, quite a bit down. So, um, 
Yeah. And, and it just goes back to, you know, that, I guess the, in, in retail, it is really about what the consumer wants. Um, and I think what, what we want them to want is quite different than what they actually want. If that makes sense. Um, what the consumer wants, you mean? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying. What, what they, we, I would love to, you know, have a VR headset, pick all my stuff and, you know, maybe gamify my shopping experience. <laughs> That'd be cool. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, I think, I think you have to wait till the, the market is ready to do that. And yeah. So there's a point of practicality for business to be able to say, how do we use that today? And I, I, I would, I mean, I'm the digital guy, but I would say we can't use that today because there's not enough demand for it. So it's, it's, it's a great technology, but practicality, are we going to get Ethel to, to put on yeah. a, a headset? Well, I and, think, and order I, her shopping? I think every, I can only speak from the retail market. I think yeah. every retailer has a, a splice of their customers that are early adopters and who want, you know, to push this forward and they want to play. And I would say, I, I'd say to any um, certainly retail CEO or CIO, uh, you better get your, your butt in gear um, and get ready. I would have that stuff. I would start testing all of that right now and making sure that you start playing with these early adopters who want that. And, 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 you know, yeah. we'll sort of talk about it and make it interesting to, you know, the fellow consumer. And, and meanwhile, retail store experience still is failing miserably at wayfinding. Uh, and they haven't implemented any real good technologies around that. Still despite having can, can of beans. Beans for a number of years. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, that's an observation point, in the States, yeah, uh, a, a leading indicator, uh, Costco uh, installed uh, self-checkout lines. So there's an interesting trend to notice that that is becoming more preferred. And I do believe it's from pandemic, not wanting to interact with checkout people. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's also a cost cutting exercise. So all the retailers <laughs> are hurting um, and, you know, their profits are plummeting. And, you know, they, they look at their, you know, P and L and they say, let's get rid of people and put machines in. Um, so that's, that's been their go-to for years in Australia as well. So, yeah. so I, I, oh, perfect. Jo Jonathan, yeah, go for I, it. I spent the last year, you know, like my, my last five years are working with old people, you know, predominantly people who are over 60. So I, I know the population. Well, that population thinks in terms of substitution. And they, 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 they put on, they wonder, you know, like, is the, are these virtual reality goggles, to what extent do they substitute for the experience that I know and am familiar with? Yeah. Um, but I also know the, the 20, you know, sort of the kids who are under 20, they don't think that way. They don't think in terms of substitution, they prefer, they, they differentiate. They prefer some things about the online experience or the virtual experience and some things about the real experience. And they're quite capable of making very sophisticated uh, evaluations, you know, sort of weighing, you know, trade-offs and, you know, sort of, so, so I, I have to say, I think Amy's on, on, on point here, like, like anybody who's not experimenting with this technology and figuring out like, how is this gonna work is, you know, like they're just putting their lunch on you know, on a pedestal for other people to eat. Like, like yeah. I, I think that's obvious. Yeah, so it is. Thanks, obvious. Jonathan. And thanks, thanks, Amy. Um, Claire, Claire, you had a comment in the in the chat about uh, your gala event. Do you mind sharing sharing yeah, us so how it went? The, yeah, we've been doing a gala for many years, and it's kind of was twenty seven years a long time, and we're a very small organization, but it was um, a flagship event. And so we have also aged, our clients have aged and some of them stop going out anyway. And we were like, okay, we're gonna have to get some new people. So when everything hit, everybody was like, cancel, cancel, cancel. And I'm like, no, nah, because everybody's depressed. We need to do something to keep people upbeat. So we found some great honorees. And then it was funny because we wanted to move to, um, to um, hop in because we figure everybody else is doing Zoom and we're supposed to be the premier Caribbean group in America. 
if everybody's doing Zoom, we just can't do Zoom. It's just going to be too ordinary. <laughs> but it's a bit different. So we said, we want to use, I'm happy. What was funny, well, stressful, it's funny. No, it wasn't funny then. When we were actually doing a test and, you know, design, I would have the group, the internal. No, this is a group of volunteers. So only the person who's going to help us with the actual design is going to be paid and a few musicians, etc. But most of it is all volunteer. So we're going to meetings almost every week, and this is the attitude of the volunteers. No, what we just can't do Zoom. Zoom, nobody wants to learn anything new. And we're like, no, we can't. We want to have a, 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 so this experience should be close to what we had before. The year before, we had our gala at the Smithsonian, right? So how are we going to just have this half-dead Zoom thing, which everybody does? So we wanted to hop in because we could have, like, you know, lounge area, go here to hear the steel pan, go here to see the mixologies and all of this drama. Everybody's like, our people are old. They don't want to learn nothing new. Okay. So after much ado, I insisted. And, you know, on the night when, we, when the people who were involved in the planning and we kept on meeting on on hopping. We lost, we can't find our way, it's too complicated. Even the people who are under 40, I mean, I'm over 60, I was like, oh, what's wrong with you people? You're young, why are you behaving like that? I'm the one that should be behaving like this. And I'm bored with Zoom, let's try something new. Long story short, we had a great guy who would help us put together. We had it on Zoom. We had the experience of having three different rooms to could network with the people who, who we're being honored. We also give some of the companies a private pre-party experience you could go to. And so, I mean, we're thinking, oh, how are we going to top that this year? What are we going to do that's different? <laughs> because we can't repeat ourselves because by now, we're figured other people have done this. So it have, no, we're common. So how do you get that excitement factor, that enchantment factor? And so, yes. And so in June, of course, we're having a month long series of events. And I'm thinking, we got to do something exciting in June because I was on Zoom all month. We had events almost every day in June last year, 12 hours sometimes. So I can't be on Zoom all day this year the same way. I will just die of boredom myself. So what was nice about it in that moment of stress was connecting. And you know, funny enough, last night we had a meeting and I actually broke down crying at the end and I was saying goodbye. Cause I mean, it's just like, just the fact we're 42 of us are on the call and we're planning for this big event in June. And I'm thinking to myself, my God, when will I see somebody skip it again or touch them again? But I just felt still hopeful that at least we were connecting. And quite frankly, the, the digital space has given us a gift we never had before. Were we not forced into this space, we would not have had the people from around the country paying me any attention at all to pull off this national event. They would be just doing their own little thing in physical. Now that it's in virtual, everybody wants to make sure that I'm promoting their event, you know, at the same time. So I do think there's pluses and minuses, but I'm thinking already about what would be the future. I think we have to move, to, I'm already assuming it's going to be a hybrid, that some things will have to be um, streamed because people will not be able to afford to travel and they've gotten used to being present now, even though they can't travel. And so we have to have a design lens that says, how do we create um, a hybrid that offers wow factor to both the people who are arriving in person and those who are gonna be, online yeah true there is there is definitely a a move towards more of that that hybrid as well um and, and to me that's for and again i want to roll it back to 2021 april we kind of have to make it very practical for people right we can't have these um you know super tech type events because as claire was saying like why why would you do that i don't want to learn anything new i just want to do you know what what got us here type thing so Thanks for sharing that, Claire. Can I just pick up on what you're just saying here? Yeah. In Go Australia, picking up on Amy's point, we're going pretty well. Uh, zero cases in Melbourne today, but uh, we had 100 days of lockdown in Melbourne, which turned into 120 days, and Doyle was ringing me regularly going, mate, are you still alive? I haven't heard from you. We're worried about you being turning into a zombie. And um, one of our favourite places did nothing. And then out of lockdown, we rang them and they said, oh, mate, there's no ordering online. Just come in. There's a line at the front, 45 minutes. I said, 
I rang, I rang him and I said, you want me to stand in line to get a pizza and you've had 120 days to do something. You know, well, what were you doing for 120 days? I mean, you, you knew this was going to end. And what did you just days. sit around, <laughs> you know? And they did nothing and they did, they've got nothing. So we don't go. But coincidentally, and this is why I want to mention it, there's a really cool app called Open Table. A, 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 a cafe 10 minutes from my house, walking distance, they don't even take bookings over, over there. They say, mate, can you just do it on the app? It's easier for us. You go on the app, pick a time, pick a table. You're guaranteed to get a spot. We know where you are. You get an hour, so there's plenty of time to eat your breakfast and have a coffee or two. We're not going to kick you out, but, you know, you know you've got a time. And I thought, this is two cafes in my area. One did nothing. I haven't been back. One just simply used this app, our open table, and the way they do it, it's $19 a month to pay, take part and $3 a table. Every time they book a table through this app, you pay this site $3. But my wife go there and spend 50 bucks because we buy breakfast and we have a couple of coffees. Or you can pay 99 bucks and make it $2 a table. So the, the company doing the tech's making money and the, the cafe loves it because it's all there. Like they know who's coming. They know how much they spent. They know how long they're staying. And Amy, you've got a you've got a thought on that. Yeah, Amy, thanks. Well, I, yeah, no. I actually wanted to ask Claire something if I could. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Please, yeah. Claire, when you um when you did this event, how did you find um I know it was you know really interesting and you reached a new market. How did you find your RSVPs once it was virtual? We were trying to be cool. We didn't want to pay the price on hopping because it was higher than, than Eventbrite. So we had to game the system. So we made the people pay on Eventbrite, those who were paying. We gave away quite a few free tickets or discount, heavily discounted tickets, like $20 tickets. Um, but And then we got them free on to, um, um, on to um, hopping. So we kept on, because it was new, we kept on sending things on Eventbrite two days to come, have you signed in it for hopping? Then we did a video, welcome. Then we had a concierge explain if they were lost. And we put also a phone number, if you couldn't find your way, call this number. So we really thought through the different points of irritation and then also the fear factor. Cabin people are very miserable. So we didn't want them to really talk, talk about us badly and trash us in public. So we had to really think through even if they can't find us, let's try and solve the problem. You know, so we really yeah. had a lot of practice runs thinking through different ways. But but the year you had the actual event versus l this past year. Okay. Um, what, was, what were your RSVPs? What were your numbers like? The, or, did you have more or less? Also, the, the year before was kind of also different because it was our first time at, at, this, at the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a major change from being at the Marriott. Yeah. And so we had a slight bump. I think we had almost 250 mm. people, but we actually made more money in profit this year. In fact, we didn't make any money the year before because by the time we pay for cater and security and all that drama, yeah. we made more because even though the sponsors gave less, we had less to pay out. We didn't have to right. pay any food. And the numbers were? The numbers were less. We only had about 150 compared to 250. So, you know. Mm. But the okay. ROI was better. But there was less it, cost yeah. though, right? Less yeah. cost, less, yeah. Less cost? Because yeah. like we, we, you know, as yeah. you know, Doyle, we run events yeah. for retailers, different workshops and classes. And um, during during COVID, you know, we ran virtual events and we ran face-to-face -face ones once, you know, it was opened back up. And I found that um, we had probably more RSVPs, but we had way less participants yes. um, than we did in our, our, our real events. Oh, um, that's your point. It's true. It's true. Yeah, our real RSVPs, events but it didn't show up. It didn't show up. But um, but the virtual events, um, we'd have a whole bunch of people RSVP, and then like five percent sure. would turn up. 
That's true. So yeah, I was okay. just curious how that worked for you. It's the same yeah. thing. Same thing. Same thing. Okay. We had more people. We had 300 and something RSVPs, but only 150 people showed up. Mm, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, no, for sure. Cool. I think there's Thank something you. particular to business events. We did a, a piece of research last year, Amy, where we asked like thought leadership people that are in the speaking business, like uh, some of the key questions. And uh, the number two reason why people go to conferences is networking, right? As much as we think it's thought leadership and, you know, that author is going to tell us something amazing and Tony Robbins is going to make us walk over the fire coals. And isn't that great? It's, um, it's really getting to meet other people. And I think the insufficiency of digital right now is you never really get that feeling of I'm like, it's, it's like being on zoom, right? I'm meeting Keith for the first time today. And I, I find what he's saying is intriguing, but I'm, I'm not really experiencing the Keith experience. Right. I'd have to have a coffee. Yeah. With him, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah I there's one other element. Yeah, that's, that's actually what Doyle and I, uh, that's actually our MO right there. Yeah, we're, we're that, exact, that is yeah. exactly our MO. This idea that, we want to take this because I live in Melbourne, Australia, and you know we're an hour from the city, and no one from outside of Australia can come to Australia, and we can't come to you. So this is all you get. This is all you have. This is all you've got. So <laughs> uh, how do we make it so that I could connect you on, with you on LinkedIn or have a yeah. have a breakout second? And we've 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 done and that extensive was, that research. Was if you I know what I need, Keith? Keith? That... I need like right. my smartwatch to raise my pulse rate. It'll determine <laughs> when somebody's speaking and my pulse rates get raised, and then it will semantically just send a message to Keith automatically without well, me knowing. Now that would one of, me. yeah, one of the main things that we that we talked about uh, with Keith and I was was that people wa want to be able to go have that coffee chat. So yes, you meet somebody in the four A of a big massive thirty thousand people conference, but you can meet somebody and you can go have a coffee and some of the most successful relationships that were developed were the ones that actually did that. And, and you, you yeah. know, can we duplicate that? Do we have to duplicate that? We can, um, but it, it's done obviously in a different manner. Um, we're going to be running a little bit short on time here. I've, I think I've got like about two or three minutes. So obviously I can't get through everything. Um, is someone but, knocking on the door at four or three o'clock? Is someone knocking yeah, on your door? Yeah, we've got uh, another show, Keith. Sorry, but uh, we oh, can keep chatting for on the are next you, show. Are you um, short on rent, Doyle? Sorry? Are you short on rent? Am I short on rent? No, hey, if, 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 Rob, if you'll have us continue on then then i'm okay with that <laughs> we've got a couple extra minutes in the budget sean we have to you know dust off a couple extra Jesse. minutes okay. but uh you guys well, want to gonna... don't stop us because we love hearing you oh okay thank you um one of the this actually i wrote this down today after listening to um chauncey we had we had a cocktail hour earlier on the the 24-hour day of the swan which was a lot of fun um and what i heard was that um, like they have a, an online website for their gin and, and that sort of thing, which is cool. But to me, there's a huge difference between just ordering something online and creating an experience around it, which actually magnifies that, that capability of that business. And we're seeing it in arts, we're seeing it in wineries and distilleries. Um, and we're seeing it for those who get it, creating that experience for a customer for their audience that has to be remote that can't actually go into the the liquor store or wherever the case may be so to me and something to ponder um you know is it different and how do you actually create it different yes i can create a website and yes you can order shit from it but that's not the experience that we're looking at being able to do um a lot of the case, I obviously we don't have time for case studies but one that i talk about a lot is Cirque du Soleil they last year kind of went into bankruptcy protection because they couldn't wrap their brains around how do we actually yeah. create a, a digital experience out of 30 years of concerts, 30 years of performances, right? Why couldn't they have become sort of the Netflix of uh, the Netflix, Netflix. Of spectacle, mm. right? They kind of missed the boat and they do have like some kind of streaming service, but honestly, for the size of their audience, they certainly missed the boat on that. Um, Byron Bay Blues Festival, we talked about that. Theaters, again, the California winery, the Francis Ford Coppola and, and Sophia, they're doing like wine testing remotely. So you basically get a gift pack of, of wines, you order it and you join everybody up on a specific time and place and away you go. A company I'm working with out of Canada, Chef Toriel, they're actually bringing chefs together 
to be able to cook um, uh, what they call sociables. So they're, they're, these are supper clubs of old, but being uh, created sort of in the digital environment as well. And then honestly, this 24 hours day of the swan, it's like, this is a really good experience. And yeah, it's kind of a little bit rough around the edges and, and that sort of thing. But you know, some of the stuff we did today, we did some magic, we did some thinking, we did some drinking, we did some virtual journals. You know, we had this magic show that was like absolutely fantastic. And to me, that's part of the digital experience. So we don't have to be kind of all digital to be able to deliver that, that digital experience as well. Uh, some of the questions to, to look at, you know, what's holding most back. Some, we talked about some of these, which, which is good. Um, the language and culture of experience, virtual versus, you know, such and such. Are we trading things off? How are we actually moving things forward as well? Um, do a little bit of brainstorming. So uh, next steps, I, I guess, just kind of wrap up and we can have like, you know, a, a conversation as well whoever, for however long Rob will let us. Um, about some of the things that we need to do next. But to me, it's important to have the mindset that is key. It's not, we're not going back to normal. So you have to ask yourself, are you pushing or are you pulling kind of thing? Um, and again, a lot of us, uh, you know, this is the audience we're, we're converted, right? We know how we can actually use that. I feel that a lot of businesses still don't kind of get how they can actually put that together. Like, um, uh, so I'm trying to remember his name, the, the gin guy. Um, I'm like, I'm like, my head's ready to explode. It's like, no, you could do this. You could have sample packs. You could send them in advance and you could have, you know, zoom sessions and we could have tasting of gin from around the world. You've got a customer audience around the world, right? I'd love to do that, but businesses, they're not picking up on those signals. They're not sort of saying, well, how do we actually do this? Do we have to wait for people to come back to the store to buy our product or they can just buy it online? Uh, to me, they're missing the point. Uh, we can scale the audience now right? Not just the product. So again, using the, the gin example, yeah, you can stockpile it in stores, but is your audience going to grow? No, not necessarily. And I love this week, Keith and I had a, a, a guest from Ireland, uh, Simon, um, who talked about transportation, no, not transportation, the Star Trek thing, teleportation, that's it. Teleportation. teleportation. Yeah, the yeah. experience globally, right? We can be anywhere, we can be do it at any time, any place, global business at the click of a button as well. Um, so, you know, fundamentally it's, it's how do we create these remarkable digital experiences that are important? So I want to leave you with this. And again, we can chat and have some other conversations as well. We still have some questions, but your digital challenge, uh, think like a 21st century CEO, the internet's been in place for 25 plus years. Okay. That's not a long time, but it's been a good time. So, you know, can you be the chief expedition, experimental exploration experience officer as well, as opposed to just sort of let's let's whatever the chief executive officer right so what can we do differently what can we we do you know to be a global business to me the the audience is there the the tools are there it's just a matter of how do we actually enable these enable businesses uh to to understand how can we actually create that remarkable digital experience so what other questions do we have going forward open up the floor take yeah, questions open up the discussions floor. comments clarity some great the... discussions sorry i couldn't uh yeah who would like to say something comment on your question i i was just gonna say doyle that yeah um i don't know it's kind of like a bee in my bonnet you know the whole <laughs> the whole digital um the digital customer experience i think I think by the way of framing that, um, and somebody earlier brought up the fact that, you know, we need to work more collaboratively or uh, cooperate better. And I think that by, by sort of labeling that as a, a digital customer experience, um, it kind of squashes the creativity of that a little bit because I, I agree you said earlier that you had a great day here with the Gray Swan Guild, that you had, you know, magicians and you had all these different experiences. And that in itself is what made it special, not that it was digital. So I think for me, I, I like to sort of take that box off of that digital marketers and technology people, they, they love to um, 
you know, put everything into that, you know, online box or, um, but really if, if you're at the end of the day, if you're really trying to give an experience to a consumer, it shouldn't matter, matter how it's delivered. You know, you, you do what it takes to make the, the experience memorable, to make sure that the, it's emotive and all those kind of details that are so, ex, you know, important with a customer experience. So I don't know, I would just be maybe a little bit more cautious around, you know, the digital labeling, because while you may be delivering it that way, um, I think it also customer. limits, limits yeah. a little bit. The customer doesn't see it like that is, is kind of what you're saying. Is that what you mean? Well, they don't see it like that, but also yeah. the, the creator, whoever is creating, you know, so I, I'm a marketer and a, a branding person. Um, it, it limits the creativity of the experience for the customer to begin with. Like when you start putting things into these, you know, it has to be a digital experience or it has to, um, I, I would argue that having a magician online isn't digital at all. It may, it may have been broadcasted digitally, but to me, that's a, a almost a visceral like experience for a customer or somebody mm -hmm. who's viewing that they're having an actual experience. So I don't know, probably semantics, but Amy, can I, oh, yeah, no, I like can it, I jump yeah. in on that? I, I actually yeah. think, no, I think Amy's onto something. And um, if I can introduce a, a kind of pedagogical element here, the, you know, sort of to go back to the gin. So that's a kind of a concrete example that we could think about. Um, I'm a, I'm an amateur mixologist, so the gin is very appealing to me as a potential product. Um, I wanted to learn more about it, and you know what a great teacher thinks about is how to transform a person with an experience. It doesn't really matter what medium the experience is delivered in, which I think is what Amy is saying. The medium is is, is something that one takes. Well, it's not irrelevant. One takes account of it, but it's 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 kind of like a lens, right? You just kind of you aim it in such a way that the lens is taken into account and the, the beam lands where it's supposed to land and does the job it's supposed to do. Um, so I, I, I kind of think that the, that, that word transformation might be more interesting. You know, like what, what do you want your, you know, sort of the person who goes through this experience, whatever it is, you know, like how are they different when they come out? Um, oh, they know more about the product. They feel this such and such about the product. They, they have this relationship that they've built up or, or whatever. Um, I'm not sure how helpful that that is, but I, I just no, think it's on something. I agree. I mean, we we always like to say um, for our retail customers that um, you know the retailers of the future will be in the business of transforming their customers for, to a better version of themselves. You know, so yeah. um, and that's kind of the end goal, I suppose, is to to um, bring something to the table, wh whether it be a product or a service or whatever. Um, and if you are making an impact in your customer's life and you're helping them in some way, um, they're going to remember that, you know, they're going to remember that more than a better picture with 3d, 3d get graphics and an easy cart checkout. You know, if, if it's something that's really, truly kick ass, they're not going to care. They're going to stand in a line, a physical line, if it's really cool. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just pipe in because my role the last decade has been CIO or CDO or CTO, like head of IT and digital whisperer, basically on strategies. So when marketing to non-tech executives, you use the buzzword and you you highlight the digital because it's it's buzzwordy and it's it's whatever. But when you're talking to IT, the you know the the idea is that your strategy is inherently digital. So whether we call it digital transformation or modernization or IT strategy or digital strategy, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same thing. It's all about user experience and employee experience. So stakeholder experience and um, automation and using modern tools to highlight processes to improve that experience toward outcomes. So depending on the audience, like anything else, it's all sort of, you know, in the messaging towards the goal of actually solving the problem that, they have or don't realize they have yet, but will have in a 12-month period. 
Yeah, I've right, but the, the, so. uh, the IT, what, one of the things I would dif differentiate there is um, generally speaking, um, the creatives who are coming up with the experience to begin with, um, they're the ones who are, yeah, they're the ones creating and they usually then go to IT to say, you know, hey, how can we, how can we make this happen? How can we bring this into people's living rooms or, or whatever? Um, so I, I suppose I was um, saying that more from the creative person's standpoint of coming up with really innovative experiences for customers. I, I, I'll actually build on that is that they make the decision absent IT or insufficiently with the involvement of IT. <laughs> yes, sometimes. Out of IT, right? Because the budget shift has gone to CMO office versus CIO or CTO or CDO, whatever you want to call it. And then they become the party that has to manage the reality of the decisions mm, made absent yeah. diligence. So that's why it's really important to have a uh, integration and cohesion between the sure. overall business goals with all the stakeholders. Um, so there's not overspend and there's not integration and uh, technical debt problems. So we're, yeah, we're yeah. both right, but there's, there's layers to it. So yeah, uh, definitely. I agree. Yeah. Well, can I mention um, my sort of passion for online music and yeah, alcohol? Because I think we've touched on a few of these ideas today and uh, it's relatively new and a lot of my mates hate me for it. But um, I love, i tell you what I love as an experiential process, the idea of being able to see a band on my TV for 10 bucks. I, I'll give you an example. Ori Anthony, who's an Aussie from Adelaide, who lives in LA, did a gig at the Whiskey A Go-Go on Saturday night, her time, it was 10 bucks. There was no one in the room. It wasn't an awesome gig, but this is why I want to talk about it because I want to, I really want to play out this possibility. The Byron Bay Blues Festival had no online presence. No one saw a single piece of music. The whole thing was cut, you know, collapsed a few days before. But they could have. Orianthi, nothing, nothing. No one, no, everyone was told to go home and they all went and camped in Tweed Heads and all these other places. But um, Orianthi had a new album coming out. Could be anyone, but Orianthi is the example here. She did a gig. It was 10 bucks. It was about 3 p.m. in my house. I turned on the telly. I bought a brand new sound bar, really loud, moshing in the lounge room. Moshing's not the right word because she's not a, you know, she's not really you disturbing heavy. the neighbors, Keith. No, it was, three, it was 3 p.m. I went and checked the sound volume in the street because my wife was moshing and, um, and or at least headbanging. And so, there was an experience that cost me 10 bucks. You know, Orianthi got some money. She sold some albums oh, and she yeah. had an upscale. But what I'm really interested in is, is linking with this current trend that a lot of musos are doing, not gin, but uh, bourbon so um, and rum. So Sammy Hagar, you know, the lead singer of Van Halen or Van Hagar, as it was called when he was in it. Um, he's got a rum brand, right? And he goes to Rick Springfield. It sounds like a joke, but it's a real story. Rick Springfield, <laughs> who was in Zoot in about 1974. And he says, mate, you've got rum. I've got rum. Why don't we do a gig online? We'll play songs and we'll send rum to people's houses. And no, we'll, that's the, the part logistic. that they're missing, Keith. They, they've that's got right. the that's, distillery. I'm, I'm actually they've putting got the words audience. in their mouth. That's right. But I'm they putting words in clicked. their mouth. Yeah, they put it in their mouth. Yeah, absolutely. No, they're, so, they're drinking it while they're singing. That's right. But they're not selling any. So I know, I'm just thinking, <laughs> can we, can we, what, what's the solution there? I mean, bands can't come to Australia. Even if they wanted to, Orianti was recently interviewed and she said, look, I'm not spending two weeks in a hotel just to do seven gigs in Australia. I'm not doing it. I, I don't care who, I don't have care how much you pay me. I'm not spending two weeks in a hotel to do seven gigs because only seven cities in Australia, right? Seven big cities, not including the satellites. So, you know, she maximum 10 gigs, if, even if included Wollongong and Geelong and Ballarat, you know, so whoop, she said, whoop, look, whoop. I'm not coming. <laughs> so we can't see bands like Van Halen. Well, we can't obviously see Van Halen because Eddie Van Halen died. But the, the point is that bands like that are gigging online 
cost me the consumer 10 bucks. Wouldn't it be great if they sent me something in the mail talking about the experience? The experience was I got a bottle of Sammy Hagar's latest rum and I'm drinking it while he's singing his songs. Wife is in a jam, he's moshing out and I'm drinking rum and here we are. This is, if this is an experience that I want to have, yeah. if Sammy yeah. Hagar's not coming to Australia, it's a very good replica. Can we do, and Sir, I can never say it, Cirque du Soleil could have done that, not with the rum, but with something else. And this is the experience that's missing in the entertainment industry. I can see it clear as day. And we, we're currently in the process of working with some people about that. But are, are we on the money? Am I just off on a tangent now? No, uh, that totally it's a makes good sense. tangent. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Many Both places hands. I've never been before, and I'm enjoying the hell out of this. I feel like I'm in a bit of a bar with a rock band in the back. <laughs> it's because you good. are. That's good. It makes a lot of sense. I like that combination of uh, of reality and entertainment mixed in, and thoughtful design uh, in this uh, go around. We're a little long on this one because we're rolling into some of the non-live portions of the evening. So I thought I'd. Let it roll a little bit. and have I thought it was just because you liked me the most, Rob. And yeah. it's because I like Doyle, like everybody likes Doyle the most. And you promised me some magic right at the yeah. end. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, no. Well, I've, I've, yeah, I'll disappear. How about that? <laughs> One, two, three. No, and I do want to thank everybody. Yeah, I'm gone. Um, I do want to thank everybody. I know for you guys over on the East coast of the U S and Canada, like it's one fifteen. So you, I can see you're kind of antsy. It's like, when's he going to shut the heck up? I need to go to bed. <laughs> so thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all the insights as well. I would love to connect with you, everybody uh, on LinkedIn and Sean was making a cool idea. Maybe we can do something like a regular basis type thing as well. So as part of the Grace one, Big Foundry. so Doyle's midnight yeah. club, I could sell that. I could sell that. You know what this group <laughs> reminds me of, though? Like uh, when I used to go to international conferences, when we did meet in, people in, in person, it's like there was the group of people that spoke on stage and immediately left. And then there was a group of people that stayed around for an hour and right. talked. And then there's the other group of people, the ones that hang out at the end of the bar, like for the <laughs> next four hours and talk to each other. Even the, new me, John. <laughs> even the new <laughs> Aussies that showed up in the morning, I, you, you've captured the esprit de corps of our end of the rail bar people at 2 a.m. in the morning having a demonstrable conversations about the best morning python movie so um so yeah. thank you and, and i love the one, fact that we're a support group for keith as well and his loud definitely. music playing abilities uh, <laughs> and his drum. can we get a photo can we get a, a zoom photo? If you guys if you guys do something funny i'll take a picture do something yeah, funny do though, like photo. Australians or something. Yeah, sing waltzing Matilda for us, please. <laughs> no. well, that's not funny. The new version? I'm telling you, it's like, be funny here. Like, oh, you look okay, at that. Everybody, oh. picture time. The hands? So I want to, I, hands, hands up, hands this, up. This is for Keith. Hands up, hands up. Oh, hands yeah, it's Brickett, yes, right. yes. Hands <laughs> up, hands up. Oh, I like that, I like Chris that. Chris and I oh, side by side. Chris and I side by side. So uh, I do want to thank everybody for coming. We do have this one little thing. Uh, there is a, a live journal that we've done, um, and you, you folks, if you got to see what happened uh, today, um, this instant daybook has occurred, and I posted the link. You can It's all available to you. Keep the link. You can add to it, but we've got the, uh, hang on, where is that? Wow. So uh, this has been uh, recorded through the day. And uh, it was uh, invented by Sylvia and Nicole, and uh, we worked on it together. It was a joint effort. If you go to the link, you can add features to it. It's uh, co-written by everyone. It's memories from what we did today. Wow. Uh, there are elements for the, uh, we got from photos. How is this going on? I don't know who's got the screen. Maybe it's not me. I got it. Oh, you got it. That's why. Uh, but if you just go through and you go down further, there's each of the sessions. I even did a little one for you, uh, Doyle. There's one at the end that's uh, clipped together some of the notes. Uh, so we have uh, a wrap, Doyle, uh, right at the end of the, the live portion of uh, the Gray Swan Gill's first ever Day of the Swan, mm. uh, conceived by everyone at once. It was this group thing at one of the sessions we did, and it turned into the month of the swan, the week of the swan, and this is the day of the swan. There'll be aftermath. Uh, this is uh, 
an uh, amazing event. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, Lindsay, this morning, and Augustine. Uh, we did Clubhouse at the same time as Zoom. It was all a practice effort. This is an unconference. We started planning this, Sean, I believe, on April 6th. Yeah, this would have scared most event planners because uh, I think they called us crazy and weird. So uh, we did it anyway. Yep, with 15 live sessions. We're going to go all night. We recorded most of this in a haphazard way that should be pretty funny. We've recorded it in writing uh, that we can uh, turn this into a publication. And I really thank everybody, everybody who's involved in this. If I've forgotten anybody, anybody, it's totally my fault. I'm a little tired. I think I started this at 6.15 this morning in Eastern Standard Time. I kind of hung around, took a bit of a break, and it's been novel. Just the memory making in the chat, the chat's like a book. It's kind of like on the road, <laughs> this stream of consciousness, because some people took the time. Like I look at some of the comments that I was making, I was going to the left or the right. Uh, uh, there was some little stuff in there. We looked to mine it further. So without further ado, I see the M&Ms and we are done for the- What are you talking about, Rob? I see the yeah, m, &M. &M. <laughs> So thank you so much. Thanks, Rob, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. That's it. That's it. That's all. Good night. Congratulations. Cheers. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks. That was amazing. Bye. Have lunch. Have a good dinner. Bye. -bye. Good Bye -bye. night. Stick around, Rob, for one sec. Yep. <laughs> hey, Keith. Thanks very much. No You're worries, mate. You you want to come on our show? Can you please come on? Come on our show. We, we've got a couple of different shows coming, so you guys come on our show. Absolutely, absolutely, love to. You have to like. Hey, we'll, I, we'll sing like, Panama. I'll. I'll. Do, are you Eddie or am I Sammy? Which one are you this time? Mm. Uh, I might be the bass player. I'm. I'm the bass player. <laughs> I, I, look, I can do. I can do a pretty good David Lee Roth. We just do, really? we do a bit of a. We could do a mock up. You can tell my hair people on. you found two Canadians and we know all about Canada and we're going to teach every Australian about what the real Canadians are and we'll just make everything up. Yeah. Anyway, but to look, I think we've got some synergy here. You're welcome to come on our show, but Dawn knows all about it. We've got, we're nice. doing Restream and StreamYard and all sorts of stuff, but you guys do your thing and send yeah. me anything I can help you with. Yeah. Talk to you later. I appreciate it. You're a revelation. Great. Thank you for joining us. Awesome. No worries. Take See care. You. Bye now. Well, brother. I thought he wouldn't leave. <laughs> yeah, he was on a roll. Oh, are, like, we being are we still recording? We're still recording. Yeah, this is uh, the, just say goodbye. Say goodbye. I was joking, Keith, if uh, this is on the uh, the real. He's, he's the guy at the end of the bar that you stay with because he's telling a great story. I'm just like, I'm laughing.